sales organization, you want 60% or better of your business coming from referrals. And so now I'm learning that things are not so straightforward like that. Yeah. That's coming with, with time, maturity, emotional intelligence. I started getting into the environment of hunting at seven. Oh, wow. Because I started to shoot the bow, you know, bow and arrow and, and learning that. And... What I learned is that people don't like the scripted version of you. Well, guess what? That building was 100% leased, fully spoken for prior to certificate of occupancy. I think that people don't see that. They just think like exactly how you said, like it's just like, oh, I just, I just woke up here. There's two sides to passion. Right? There's a harmonious side and there's an obsessive side. Sometimes you expect the punch because that right. leaves the person open. So, you know, I knew where to take my hits. I knew when to duck. Right. He looked at me straight in my face and told me, listen, I'm good whether you make it or you don't. I'm good. You, you're not. Welcome to another episode of the Bottom Line Podcast where we say what we mean and we mean what we say because at the core of everything that is, was, and forever will be, there will always be the bottom line. Today's guest. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Bottom Line Podcast where we say what we mean and we mean what we say because at the core of everything that is, was, and forever will be, there will always be the bottom line. Today's guest, Mr. David Germain. Now, David Germain here is what I like to call a parallel entrepreneur. You're going to see I talk to a lot of parallel entrepreneurs, right? Mainly because David started out in the real estate space and real estate, you know, in New York got a little crazy with the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I've always said it. I've always said it, right? That uh, real estate is a stepping stone. As a, as a residential broker, as a residential agent, that's really a stepping stone. You don't realize it until you start going through it. When you start going from like office to office, you start to realize that the systems, the processes are really based on your performance and how you're able to, you know, use those resources. It's a stepping stone. Being a residential agent is a stepping stone. It's not something you're going to do for 20 years, 30 years out of your life. It's not going to, I don't think so. I, I don't see any realtors that really enjoy doing it for that long, right? They usually take that money and they invest it into other businesses or other things so that they can make more money. They, they make that money work for them. So David Germain here was a realtor, a uh, real estate broker with five fave realty. And uh, he made the transition from real estate into the insurance business, which is really where I said, you know what, this guy, you talk to David about, so it's like two different things, two different like personalities. You talk to David about real estate, he's got a little passion there, it's still there, you can feel it. But then you talk to him about life insurance and he's like a kid on Christmas, he lights up. And I say, you know what, your heart is into this thing. And we're having a conversation on the phone. And I said, David, I'd love to have you on as a guest of the podcast because you're not, you're not pitching. This is something that, you know, yeah. that you're living and i think that there are two kinds of people out there there are textbook people who read you know theory and there are people who have you know application and they apply what they've learned and they've actually lived what they learned that's an old school adage that uh you know experience is the best teacher so david you're a beast at what you do and i'm not going to take any longer i just wanted to give you you know your flowers your recognition and let these people know that you know this is going to be an a value add conversation right all across the board so thanks for taking the time my man for being a guest on the podcast how are things going with you all right first i want to give a, a big huge shout to my my lord and my savior jesus christ Amen. and to the glory thank you for having me here um you know what you just said is very very crucial and right on the spot you know there's people uh who talk it but then there's another person there's the people who actually live it and execute it, you know and man you know the transition and you you watch how you know god bring you know orders our steps and walks us through different phases and journeys and and, and levels in our life you know and you just got to be in amazement because you know when I even think about real estate, right, and I still have a passion for real estate, so it's not like I don't have yeah. that passion. Mm -hmm. It's um, I realized I probably I was in real estate before I even got my license and got into real estate, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I say all of that because uh, when I was younger, just to give a quick a synopsis of my story. Um, when I was younger, I got hit by a car. Mm. Thank God I don't look like what I've been through, you know, because the devil tried to take me out. Mm. But 
you kill me when he had a chance, right? Mm -hmm. And I look at that because I have a steel plate in my jaw and I shattered. You know, it's crazy. I made my dentist a lot of money. Put it that wow. way. Wow, yeah. Right? And when life almost gets snatched from you, I don't care who you are. You want to look at life differently. Amen. Yeah. You had near-death moments mm -hmm. when you almost, like, this, yeah. lose your life, you're going to start thinking differently. You're going to appreciate the small things. You're going to appreciate life. You're going to appreciate the things that you can do. Yeah. Because right now as we speak, you know, there are people, and now everybody says, oh, i got a problem. I'm like, you don't have a real problem. <laughs> yeah. Fix. Yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. The people, in my, in my opinion, who got problems, and they still don't even make excuses. People got their arms missing, legs missing, right? Um, you know, people who can't see, they're blind, or they got cancer. Like when my mom got struck with cancer, and the doctor says, you only got four months to live. I think that's a problem. That's a problem. You understand? So yeah. we got to really think yeah. about what a problem really is. Yeah. You know, I laughed at that because I'm having a conversation with my son the other night. And, um, you know, he's like nine, right? And I'm like, what problems do you have as a nine-year-old? You know what I mean? Like, you have... Yeah, yeah, they have problems, <laughs> right? They have their own little problems, right? But, I, you know, I, I laughed because I said, you got a problem? No problem, Right. And um, that's how we're, that's how we're going, right? And I'm like, you, you know, life is easy. We tend to overcomplicate it as people. Life is actually pretty simple, but as people, we seem to sometimes we want more than we can actually handle, and so we create, you know, a, yeah. Sometimes we uh, we uh, we make something more complicated than it needs to be. So life is actually simple. It's really no problem. And I say, so I say to him, um, I say, all right, here's how you're gonna deal with this. Do you have a problem? No problem. Do you have a problem? If he says yes, so I said, Does he have, do you have a problem? He says yes. I said, okay, no problem. Do you have a problem? He says, no. I say, great, see, no problem, right? And we just keep doing this back and forth, back and forth until he realizes the next day he wakes up and he's like, Papa, you got a problem? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I got a problem. He says, okay, no problem, right? So if you apply you that- You hit the nail on the head. You hit the yeah. nail on the head. Because you know what it is? Yeah. What most human beings have and this is what also separates us from every other species. We have a thinking and knowledge problem. Yep. Right? Because you said life is simple. Yeah. Life is simple if you're disciplined. Yeah. And you think things through. Think it through. Right? They say discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. Mm. Right? Uh, yeah. Well, you see, most of us are not disciplined and most of us are using, just like how it's funny, we have an iPhone, right? Yeah. And everybody gets a new iPhone, right? And stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. and then they're using a new operating system. Right. Right? If you notice from when the iPhone started back in, what, I think, 19, 2000, whatever year it started, yeah. right, to now... They never stay complacent. That's one. Right. And they always kept upgrading their system, their operating systems. Right. What's interesting as humans, we sometimes we go to school and the last book or knowledge that we learned was probably when we were in high school or college, if we went to college. Yeah. Think about the information that you learn in college. Even when you get a degree, the information that you learn in this pace world that we're living in, in this information technology world that we're living in, after six months, that information becomes obsolete. Yeah, so we gotta come We all have a knowledge problem. Hose yeah. In the Bible says, Hosea 4 verse six, my people are destroyed hmm. for lack of knowledge. Every problem that you and I ever had in our life was a knowledge problem. Hmm. If we knew better, we can do better, mm -hmm. right? Every decision and choice that we make in our lives was based on the information, the knowledge, and the data that we had at mm -hmm. that moment. Yeah, That's why sometimes people say hindsight is 2020. Man, if I knew that Brooklyn would have been million dollar properties back in the 90s and the 80s right. when they found 
ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars for you can right. get three planning for that price. How many people would have bought it? But you see, and that's why it says also without a vision, the people perish. Yeah, you gotta see things before they happen. Yeah, so it's a mindset too, right? Would you agree? It's a mindset, right? So let's let's think about it, right? When you talk about uh, problems and problem solving and solu being solution oriented, right? Is that what got you into sales, or was it just the need to have to make money that got you into sales? Like, what got you into sales? Man, great question. So I believe it was a culmination of a lot of things, right? Uh -huh. So the first one, I go back to the story when I got hit by a car. And I was in third grade. The car, instead of going, you know, when the yellow light comes, yeah, it's slowing down. He up. up. Yeah. Me over, right? And I got a settlement, right, from that. Thank God I'm okay, you know, but I got a settlement from that. So I get $100,000, but you got to understand, nobody talks about money at the dinner table. It's so interesting when you even have this conversation today because today – my son, who's going to school, yeah. had to use money for the first time because we would pack his lunch, but he didn't want to eat what we eat. Or because uh -huh. everybody else would buy their lunch uh -huh. at the school. So, you know, he wants to fit in with everybody <laughs> else. Right, right. I want to buy my lunch so he can be, so he won't stand out. Right. From everybody else eating the home cooked stuff, you know, that what we know is good for him. Right. But I said today, so we gave him ten dollars. I know five years, I feel about it, man. I was five years, I didn't even get ten dollars. Five, anyway. right. Wow. He doesn't know the value of five or ten dollars just yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I gave him ten dollars and I said the lunch cost three dollars. I said, How much money do you get back today? And I, and I had to go show him subtraction. And I said, you get back seven. So make sure when you come back home, you have $7. Nice. Right? I said, where are you going to put the money? Yeah. And I had to teach him that whole process because this is his first time. Yeah. It's actually a proud dad moment here. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Teach him about money for the first time. But at the same time, nobody taught me because I grew up without a home, without a father. You know, I grew up in the, in the hood in the 80s and the 90s growing up. And you saw Juice. If you saw New Jack City. You know, <laughs> That's where you learned about there. money. Remember Sugar Hill Gang? Yeah. Class everywhere. People pissing on the corners like they just don't care, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at that video, guys. Look how New York used to look. And tell me if you would have invested and bought property back then right 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 just think about that i'm shaping it yeah because everybody said oh i wish i would but would you nah yeah you see what's funny about that though so like you're from that generation where the game is to be sold not told right and so like today what you find is a lot there's more telling than selling Right. And I think you got guys who are up there, especially with the, you know, social media. When I was younger, it was Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Like Trump was yeah. like everybody wanted to be like Trump because he was like the name. Everybody saw him with, you know, he looked like the guy. Right. But then you look back a little further and, you you know, from a generation before that, it was more like the Rockefellers. You know what I mean? And then people even then, you know, back then it was like the names on the on the skyscrapers. That was what it was. You saw a name on a skyscraper like, you know, the Hilton or, you know it wasn't there that information wasn't there so you wouldn't know you know what i mean so today it's kind of like even when you look at those movies you see graffiti on the trains like graffiti yeah. on the tr on outside of the train and inside the train inside. Like, there was graffiti everywhere so it was like this doesn't look like who was thinking about that you know what i mean it didn't feel good because crime was at an all-time high yeah drugs came out which we all <laughs> that's right. all we want to go I mean, but it's part of the game right because you see right. people that came from that generation like look at jay for instance jay-z and like you know a lot of these rappers that came out of the crack era, they understood how that there was transferable skills, right? From like, you know, being a crack dealer to like now big look at him. He's a billionaire. He he just amplified, he doubled down on his skills. You know what I mean? So I think well, that if you could unpack that, because you brought up a good point, right? Yeah, yeah. There were other people that hustled with Jay. Yeah. At that time. But they didn't end up becoming a millionaire. Yeah. A billionaire. Yeah. That's it. So, so, yeah. What was it? What was different about Jay? So I think so. Reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt. Right. Reasonable doubt came out. For instance, 
when that album came out, you know, Jay had already made it, or at least that's what it looked like from, you know, from the beginning. This is the first guy to come out with an album. Yeah, but he was on a yacht. Like his first, like the one that I remember, you know, the rappers, I I grew up on the Lords of the Underground. I grew up on the Lords of the News. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, um, I grew up with the, with the groups, Wu-Tang. I grew up with like Helter Skelter, you know, Smith and Wesson. These guys are like, you know, army fatigues, you know, underground. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Then you see Jay come out. He's like the new era. This guy's on a yacht. He's like, you know, in my lifetime, he's like, you know, this guy is big balling. So it's like, he kind of came out and you thought he made it when he first came out. And I think he raised the bar. You know what I mean? But then you listen to the album and you see how well he's traveled because part of the coat game is like going state to state. You know what I mean? So he was, he was, through his travels, he learned a little bit. And a lot of people, you know, when I was younger are block limited. They stay wherever they're at. You know what I mean? And they weren't able to grow outside of that because it was some okay. Brooklyn kids wouldn't go to New York City. They want to go to the to, to Manhattan. Oh. Queens kids wouldn't leave Queens. They want to go into Brooklyn. So right. for you to leave Brooklyn and go into Manhattan was like, <laughs> that was a huge deal. So imagine going, you know, out to the South or going down to Midwest and you're moving heavy weight. Right. Like Jay was talking about in Reasonable Doubt. I think he, his eyes were more open to like how things right. are done and how he had to, you know, he had to like maybe duck the law in a certain, in different ways where he just figured, you know, and I knew dudes from the block who would go OT when the block got hot. And when they went OT, they kept a low profile. But when they came back, they were a whole different persons because they, they saw life differently. So that's the era of like the game is to be sold, not told. And, you know, today everybody's telling or everybody's like projecting or they're acting like something that they're not. You know what I mean? And it kind of like there's a misconception there. Right. And I think when you get into sales, that's why I was asking you, was it for money or was it really because you wanted to solve a problem? And I think when you yeah, mentioned talking to your son, when you yeah. mentioned talking to your son about money, you know, the, the ten dollars you gave him today is not going to be the same ten dollars in like two years from now. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So it's like, what do you do with that? Right. Like, the equivalent of my mom, 40 years of 40, because I'm 45, 40 okay. years old, giving me maybe a dollar or a quarter or a dollar. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. what ten dollars is like the equivalent of a dollar today. Of yeah. Back then. Yeah. You know, sad to say, but yeah. <laughs> so when you got into the game, right? Let's start with real estate. Like what motivated you? What attracted you to real estate to make you want to get into it? Was it the money or was it helping so you? What happened in that situation, it was more or less how I felt when I worked for the Board of Education okay. for 15 years. Yeah. I was a paraprofessional, which is like the equivalent of a teacher's assistant. Okay. And I was only making thirty thousand dollars, but I loved what I did because I was around the youth. I worked at uh, John Jay High School and we won a championship. And, you know, being around them really gave me a lot of energy, you know? Mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that they didn't grow up the way I did uh-huh. and get the leadership and the skill set. That's right. But then one day my phone rang and my mom, when she was alive, got into a car accident, mm-hmm. right? Which can happen anybody. And she said, I'm, I'm at the hospital. So here it is now. My heart, it dropped. I mean, mm-hmm. to hear my mom in an accident, you know, think about how you're feeling, right? So I go to my boss, and here it is. I come to work early. I leave later than what I even get paid for. Mm-hmm. I do more than what I get paid for, should I say. Yeah. And I never took a day off. And because it was a Friday, they, it was raining, and teachers were calling out because they had a, it's like Columbus Day, how you have a weekend on a, 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 a holiday on the Monday so they could have a four day weekend. <laughs> right. Yeah. So because you know what happens when a, when a substitute teacher comes in. Yeah. Kids, they're going to go bonkers because they, go they don't crazy. Yeah. The, the right? The main, right. the substitute. So yeah. that's how my boss was looking at it from her angle. She's like, if I go, then the kids are going to be running around crazy. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. I bring stability. But yeah. at the same time, I said, Ms. Bloomberg, yes, I said her name. Yeah. You don't have a mother? My mother is in a car accident. Wow. The teachers go in, they have a dentist appointment or they have to get something for the kid. It will be an open door policy, but the one time I need to leave. So the great Maya Angelou said, people forget what you do, 
People even forget what she was saying, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. I remember how I felt that day because I felt like a prisoner. I couldn't go. And I said, you know what, Ms. Bloomberg? Here I'm about to do it. I'm going to leave right now, and you can either A, dock my pay, yeah. or you can write me up. Yeah. But I'm going to leave right now. And I had to take that stance, right? And because I took that stance, mm -hmm. she said, okay, okay, David, we'll find someone to replace you. Mm -hmm. But after that, I went from loving the job to now I hated the job after that. Mm -hmm. So after that experience, coming back to the job now, well... I would take a two hour lunch break. I would come in late. I just didn't care anymore because I'm like, you didn't care about me and my well being and my family when I needed the, the, the time off. Mm -hmm. So then they said, David, we no longer need your services, right? Kind of like what's going on with Kawhi or Kyrie Irving. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a Brooklyn Nets fan. That hurts me. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, we, hopefully we still win a championship. But anyway, Mm -hmm. No longer need your services. And then that's when I discovered real estate. I was in the barbershop and I remember mm -hmm. I saw a guy clean cut like yourself doing, mm -hmm. you know, and next thing you know, he was driving a nice car. And this is back in 2006, mm -hmm. right? We were just getting out of the, um, the, the financial crash, the, 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 uh -huh. the, the recession. Mm -hmm. And, Next thing I know, I'm like, oh, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm doing real estate. So then he's like, you know, you can go get your license. Next thing you know, I go get my license. And I was with a broker that was in Manhattan, show me like the ropes. And I'm like, wow, going back to what you were saying. Yeah. Not being able to see what it, what it looks like on how other people live. And mm -hmm. it's interesting when you're in real estate as an agent, you get to see firsthand how some people are living mm -hmm. and i remember seeing what people are living like in manhattan and then certain parts of brooklyn and queens and then i met my my, my other broker rico raymond rico we shout out to rico mm -hmm. uh rapper realty and anthony lolly nice you know, nice rapper realty and man these guys took me under their wing because they saw the hunger because when i lost my job with the board of ed i'm on unemployment mm -hmm. now Here's the timeline, right? Mm -hmm. My mother gets sick mm -hmm. with cancer, right, in 2010, with breast cancer. Oh, man. Then she passes away March 2011. Ugh. Because during that time, mm -hmm. you understand, my mom helped, uh, my mom took, uh, I didn't even tell you that when I got the settlement for $100,000. Mm -hmm. I blew $90,000 within four months. Wow. Because back then, the environment that I was around told me the only way you get respect is if you get the nice car with the rims, the system. Yeah. The TVs. You would hear me coming down the block. Yeah, I was that guy. You would hear me setting off car alarms. <laughs> right. I look back at it now and I'm like, why was I doing that? Yeah. You know, that was so dumb. And then you get all these fake friends and people who now, back then they didn't know me, but now I'm hot. They all on me. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like that Mike Jones song, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nobody talks about money. So I didn't know the difference between an asset and a liability at that time. Mm. So I'm 18 years old. I'm just trying to live my life for now. I'm not thinking about the future. My mother said that money was supposed to be used to either buy a house Mm -hmm. Or to go to college. Yeah. You know, my college at 18, I wasn't thinking about it like that. Nobody so is. I'm down to my last $10,000. Mm -hmm. My mother said, Boy, you stupid. That money's supposed to be, like I said, for college or to buy a house. Yeah. I had a joint account. She forcefully mm -hmm. put the $10,000 away and invested it into buying a multifamily home. Wow. In Park Slope. Nice. Back in 1993 for $130,000. The $10,000 was enough for the deposit, for the down payment, and the closing costs. Wow. Like three and a half percent. You're and I said, wow. If one decision can set you forward 20 years and one bad decision can set you back 20 years, right? Yeah. And just because she did that, that $10,000 investment 
Fast forward to 2018, that house, we sold it for $2.4 million. Outstanding. Now, it also led to five properties, right? Yeah, nice. But that's the success part of it. But yeah. then also there were so many challenges. Yeah. That well, let's go. Of- let's go back a little bit, right? Let's go back a little bit, because my question to you was: it because you wanted to, you know, solve a problem, or was it because you wanted the money? But really, the answer was you wanted freedom. You wanted that freedom to be able to, you know, do what you wanted to do when you need, when you wanted to do it. And it's not like you were just out there lallygagging. And it was more like, you know, what I don't like the, the the restraints that having a job puts on me when I need. I'm there all the time. I go above and beyond. But the one time I'm asking yes. for help. The one time I'm asking, not even, you know, for a raise, I'm asking, you know, I got to leave my, your mom had an accident, right? And they weren't able to understand that. It was like, all right, I realize now that I've got cuffs on me, like I'm chained to this job. And it's like, you know, it's no longer, you know, what's funny is you, you checked out, you quit before you were let go. Like you just, yeah. once you check out, and that's the thing in any relationship or business, you check out here first. Yeah. That's what happened. Emotions. Yeah. And there's so many people that are going through the motions on a job yeah. that you hate. Yep, yep, yep. You understand? Yeah. But they're doing it because they have to put food on the table, but it's fear. It's fear. Off from moving out of of that situation because yeah. they don't believe in themselves. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what? I believe in myself and I'm gonna take the chance on me mm-hmm. because I'd rather try and fail. I can live with that. Yeah. Because I know I tried. Yeah. But then the worst regret in life, and they did a study on this where they interviewed people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Mm-hmm. And they were on their deathbed in nursing homes around the world. And they asked them, they said, if you can live your life all over again, what mm-hmm. would you have done differently? Mm-hmm. You know what 90% said? What's that? that they wish they would have followed their dreams. Ah, uh, dreamer. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. never follow their dreams. Yeah. They live everybody else's dreams. Yep. They never follow theirs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you, okay. So it wasn't, it was more about freedom for you. But then the other thing is interesting because you said people don't talk about, you know, money, especially when uh, during that time, right? So it's like you don't know the value of the money. Um, and then you went out and you were buying, you know, cars and everything, trying to get respect. And what's funny is like you talk about your five year old and you say, you know what? I give him $10 to go buy lunch because he wants to fit in. So it's like, okay. Now today, here's an interesting question for you, right? Because you're in two really good industries, multi-million dollar, billion dollar industries, right? The real estate and the life insurance, okay? And both of those, you can make a lot of money. But what you see today, you're wearing a t-shirt, assets over liabilities, right? It's a t-shirt, right? And a lot of people, it's the message on that t-shirt, right? And a lot of people, when you when I see that, I think of Kiyosaki right off the bat. Like I think of Robert Kiyosaki right off the bat, right? That was the first person I learned about that from. I didn't learn about it from my father or anything. I learned it from Kiyosaki, right? But then I wonder, I wonder here, okay. Today you find a lot of people who are doing a lot, they're doing a lot on social media to make themselves look like they're doing well or like they, you know, they're rich or they have a lot of money. And you don't know what that looks like, what their profit and loss statement looks like. You don't know what, you know, their financial statement looks like. You know what I mean? So it's like a guy like you who you've lived it, you've been through it. How did you make that um, decision to say, you know what, I'm not going to, after you, your mom made that investment for you, you could have continued to blow money. And it, you could have said, you know what, that wasn't my decision. I don't want to maintain that property. When did you come to that realization that, you know what, I want to stick to this and I want to not only stick to it, but I want to impact people. I want to help people to realize that they could change their situation. When did that happen for you? All right. So growing up in East Flatbush, Brooklyn during the 80s and the 90s. Where? Seemed- where in East Flatbush? Tell me where. I'm on 55th and Lennox. Shout out to my 903 Lennox Road crew. Got right. you. All right. So, you know, if you heard about the songs about the 50s and all that. Anyway, long yeah. story. Short. 50s is real. So, yeah. 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 And growing up there and then all of a sudden when I turned 18 yeah. and then mom, thank Lord, helped to buy this house in Park Slope. So now I shift from so-called the hood to now living in Park Slope with people who don't look like me. I think what's interesting about that too is at that time, Park Slope, you know, this Brooklyn at that time was really segregated. People might not, yeah, they might not talk about it, but like, especially Park Slope was not as diversified as it it is now. 
You know what I mean? Two chocolate chips and a whole bunch of vanilla. Yeah. So for your mom to have that, take that, that, that approach and make that decision, that was way outside the box. You know what I mean? That thinking was way outside the box. And I asked her about that. I said, what made you do it? But you know what? As a mom, she's looking out for the school districts because she's a teacher. Got it. So she knows that Park Soap and she saw that the environment that I was in, me and my brother, if we continued in that environment, because we started ending up being with people who steal cars and yeah. who stole drugs. And yeah. it's kind of hard to keep your kids out of that mix yeah. because it's so strong. That that energy, unfortunately, is even with good parenting, it's still hard to keep them out of that situation. So the streets are always looking for new blood, new blood. Yeah. yeah. So she saw that happening. And she said, no, 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 we're going to get out of here. Mm. And because of that decision, I believe that saved my life. Mm. Because now I'm around different types of people. And it's so funny when I moved to Park Soap, and I would want to go back to my old neighborhood. And I would go back, and I thought my friends would come visit me <laughs> on the other side. Right. I said, well, here, let's play some ball. Nah. Yeah. Nobody would come on my side. Yeah. Right. Right. But then I started seeing how other people live on the other side. Yeah. And I started that people out here, they got health food stores. I saw tons of banks. They would have pretty much all the things that you would need. It was mm -hmm. like a little city. Yeah. That they had everything. They had to go outside of that. Yeah. And I, started, and I started, even the Chinese food. Oh, yeah. It was different. It was different. Yeah. There's one on 6th Avenue and Union Street. Go yeah. there. Knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, it just tastes different. You know what's funny? My father used to take me there, right, all the time, because I was born at Methodist Hospital, right? Okay. Yeah. So my father used to, and there's a Barnes and Noble that opened up there when I was in college, right? right. So I went to um St. Francis over in Brooklyn Heights. Nice. Right? So, That's when we won our championship. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my man. John Jay, let's go. 2000, 2008. 2007, okay. 2008 championship, man. That's my okay. Project. I had like zero, zero, zero school spirit. So I hear you though. <laughs> right. But my father used to take me there all the time. And, you know, I said to myself, you know, that was one of the places that I would want to live. And because I never made it to live there because the property was so expensive, I rented a place um, when I got on my own and everything, you know, before when I was married and all. But when I had my first son, when my son was born, we were living in Bay Ridge. But mm, nice. it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar to Park right. Slope, right? But Park That's Slope everything is everything. It's a little hub. What's funny about it, too, though, is when you go there, there's more of a uh, sense of community. And there's more of a sense of, um, you know, it's not flashy. Like, you don't see a lot of, like, you know, foreign cars or anything like that. It's got this vibe, right? And it's, you don't, you can't tell. There's a lot of old money there. I put it that way. A lot of old money. again? A yeah. A lot of old money there. A lot of old money. And I would never forget, as you said that, you just made me think about yeah. the Dixon's, Dixon's Bike Shop. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't mean to put your business, Dixon's, but when I saw them, and they are so humble. Mm-hmm. And everybody would talk about this bike shop and everybody would go to bike. Man, let me tell you, you know how much properties they own in mm. Park Slope? Mm. But yet, if you see the car they drive and how they drive. <laughs> You're like, what? Yeah. Yeah. They don't dress rich or right. Rich. right, right. They dress just the way I'm dressed right now. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will never forget when I met my first millionaire in real estate. Talk to me. Talk to me. That's the story I want to hear right now. Talk to me. Yeah. All right. And growing up in the hood, you think that how a millionaire is supposed to look like. Right. You know? Right. I had this vision in my head, like, okay, they're going to dress like this and they're going to have all of these nice fancy watches. And, you know, I just had this mindset. Yeah. Look yeah. Like. Mm -hmm. And then I remember he came in the office and he's like, look, I'm looking to buy some properties all cash. And yeah, I'm just looking at the guy. And he's just wearing a sweatsuit. Yeah. Nothing fancy. No, right. no label, no writing, nothing. Mm -hmm. And the guy showed me his bank account. I was like, wow. It's proof of funds, yeah. right? Proof of funds. And then you're proof like, whoa. <laughs> but then you look at him. Yeah. And you would never think in a million years yeah. he was a multi-millionaire. 
Mm, yep, that's how they roll. That's how they roll. Yeah. How did that change your life, though? Like, how did that change your life? That right there let me know. Yeah. That, um, see, I'm learning that money only accentuate who you really are. Okay, I hear that. Yeah. Because if you are a good person before you have money, yeah, nine times out of ten, you're going to probably be an even better person with money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then if you're an a hole, yeah. right? You're more before of, yeah. you have money. When you get money, you're going to probably be a bigger a hole. Yeah. With money. Yeah. Right. And all money is really is a tool in the conduit of where your heart really lies. Because these they, I learned this from a lot of my mentors. They said you can truly know the nature of a person by how they use and spend their money. So let's go into that a little bit, right? Because it's like when you talk about that, how they use and spend their money, you got some people out there who are more asset rich than, you know, and uh, cash poor. Right. And if you talk about, you know, the, the devaluation of the dollar right now, you've got digital currency or digital assets, whatever you want to call it. Right. And you've got, you know, a lot of investors who have a, a big portfolio, like in the real estate game, they have their money other, you know, in other uh, vehicles. You know what I mean? So let's talk about that just a little bit. Right. Because like oh, you touched on something that now, unfortunately, I have to learn the hard way. Yeah. Right? Because I was like a horse with my blinders on it. <laughs> Real estate, real estate, real estate. Yeah. Until March of 2020. Okay. My best year in real estate, not just throw numbers, but my best year in real estate was 514,000, right? Nice. Nice. One calendar. Calendar. nice. Now, the thing about it, I know that, and I'm not saying to impress anybody, I'm just saying that was my best year. Yeah. But then March of that year, my numbers went down hmm. because Why is that? sellers who experienced the pandemic because it was so new and mm. everybody was so fearful and scared. They did not want to sell their properties in a pandemic at that time. Sure. You think back at that time, everybody was pulling their listings. Yeah. So here I'm on the verge. I had about 11 listings. Me and my wow. team, we were verge to a million dollars in business. Mm. And now all of a sudden, nobody wants to sell their own. They're like, wait, I want to see what happens. Right. People are dying. New York is the epicenter. People are losing their jobs. You know, it was just a mess. Uh -huh. you yeah. So now people want to wait and see. But guess what? That affects my bottom line. Then on top of that, the mayor and the governor, Governor Cuomo at the time, said we weren't um, essential workers. We couldn't work for a good four to five months. Uh -huh. If we did, it would be a $10,000 fine. Uh -huh. If we caught on the house. It was a lot. So we were basically on ice. Yep. So kind of again, it felt like when I was at the job and I couldn't want to do what I want to do again. Yep. And next thing I know, I'm like, wow. So for the first time, the government and just the pandemic could affect how real estate is functioning. Mm -hmm. You understand? In a and negative way. Yeah. That's included. People were losing. Yeah. Because people had to pay those hard money loans and those mortgages. Mm -hmm. So everybody, business owners who've been in business 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. You see the stores closing. Yeah. So now the only constant thing in life has changed. So you got to pivot. It's kind of like when you go in the in the GPS and it says yeah. recalculate. Alternate route. You pivot, yeah. Right. So yeah. now I see. Where now everybody's health conscious, and I and I started learning, and it made me look at my policy, because I said, "Whoa, if something happens to me, God forbid, right?" Mm -hmm. I'm the breadwinner. I said, "If something happens to me, and I get COVID, and I can't work, and I can't show a house, how is my family going to be affected?" Because I know what it was like when my mom had got sick, and now I had to step up. You were the only breadwinner. Five. Yeah. Yeah, right now, you yeah. know. So I said, if I'm sick and I get COVID, I'm on a respirator because we don't know how it's going to affect, you know, it can affect us all differently. Some people are asymptomatic. Some people get mild. Some mm -hmm. people are severe. And I said, you know what? I need to make sure that I'm protected in the event that, you know, God may call me home, right? Yeah. And next thing I know, I started looking at my policy and I saw, and I learned about this thing called living benefits. Yeah, yeah. I never heard of this before. 
living benefits. And what living benefits is, in case anybody wants to know, it's basically saying that the life insurance company will pay you and I, if we are ever sick, whether you get a stroke, heart attack, cancer, all the ailments that unfortunately we suffer from, mm. right? Because nobody anticipates when they get a 30 year mortgage that they're gonna get sick. Right. Or they're gonna die during that 30 years. So what do you have in place or lose your job? Mm -hmm. What do you have in place that will keep your income and your family that we all claim to love, right? <laughs> what do you right. do to keep them from suffering? Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So that's where the insurance piece came in. And I'm like, wow, we insure our houses, we insure our cars, we insure our phones, yep. right? We insure everything. But all of those things do not work unless we work. That's right. Yeah. So if we don't insure us, guess what? We lose the house, we lose the car, we lose everything. Yep. So this is why. I got into insurance and I realized how much of a piece of the pie that is. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with the pandemic. Yeah. That's crazy to me, right? Because a lot of people, you know, when I first got into real estate, I was selling real estate um, in Brooklyn. I want to say, uh, actually, I started out renting apartments, right? In the city. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know how it is, right? And you're doing like walk ups in the city and everything, and you're getting that fifteen percent of the annual, then you realize that you're like three months behind on your bills. So that fifteen percent of the annual goes to like six months of back payment for your bills, you know what I mean? So it's like you gotta get in the sales game. So when I got into the sales game in, in Brooklyn, it was pre foreclosures. They just I just kept finding them. You know what I mean? A lot of pre foreclosures. And those pre foreclosures were like in the most gentrified areas, you know what I mean? So like Bushwick, Bed Stuy, Crown Heights, Ocean Hill, right? Brownsville. Um and those properties were worth, you know, north of $900,000. So it was like, I was making, you know, a good amount of money on these deals, but the investors, like you said, right? What I realized with a lot of these investors with their letters oh. of intent, they were using, um, and they're still doing us. it. They were using, um, well, I don't know if it's us. I say we, here's my whole thing, right? My whole thing is, you know, cause somebody never told you, maybe you can say, all right, I didn't know. So you don't know what you don't know. But once you get the information, and you see that you can do what these guys are doing and you're not doing it, that's on you, buddy. Right. You know what I mean, you can't you can't blame anybody, you can't point fingers. I'm in the game and I'm looking at proof of funds. I'm looking at these guys who are no smarter than I am. They just got a head start because their fathers put them on. You know what I mean? And they're willing to teach me the game. That's the other thing, right? When you get these investors and they're not meeting your offer, they're not meeting your number, they'll tell you why. I always ask why. I say, what are you going to do with right. this property? This is a blank canvas. Is this going to be a hold for you or a flip for you, right? Like, right. what do you want to do? Then they started educating me about 1031 exchanges. They started educating me about the city, turning deals around, filing paperwork. You know what I mean? And right. they started talking to me because I started asking these questions. Right. They started yeah. offering me cars. They started offering me dinners, you know? So it's kind of like... And these are simple guys. They're not like flashy guys. These are really simple, humble guys, but they have assets across the country and across yes. the globe. And they'll say right. to me, I'm not going to, and they're, here's what's funny, right? You're on the call and you're negotiating here with a guy who's teaching. You got a good relationship going. You guys can curse each other out, but then they'll still call you for more deals, right? But then they'll, they'll, they'll like beef over $50,000. I'm like, yo, but you got like 2 million in the bank right now. And you're beefing over 50K. And I'm like, just just pay the 50k, and then he's, you know, then somebody will be like, well, if it's if it's that big of a deal, why don't they just take that hit, <laughs> right? So you're like, you're asset rich, but you're cash poor, right? But you, what you, what they're doing is they're leveraging, right? And I'm saying now, how do we teach that to the community um, of these new and up and coming entrepreneurs, uh, these new and up and coming. Um, side hustlers you know your children like how do you teach that because the uh the investment vehicles especially through real estate i mean through uh, life insurance they're sophisticated they're really uh, sophisticated you know it. what i mean i started looking at numbers as you just so eloquently said right and i started looking at it where if you google how much people live on the planet it's about 7.9 billion right okay and then on top of that if you google how many people live in the united states it's about 330 million or so, 333 million, right? Okay. Then when you really think about it, right, how many people are qualified to purchase real estate? Mm. And what I mean by qualifications is they have the down payment, they have two years of verifiable income, 
on the books, not off the books, mm -hmm. and they have the credit all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Let's go to on the books versus off the books, because now you have a lot of these small business owners who are LLCs and they're, they're scaling, they're growing their businesses, right? They hire 1099s. And then um, at the same time, they might also hire W-2s, depending on what they're trying to do, right? So what do you call on the books? What do you call off the books? On the books means what you file on your tax return mm -hmm. to the IRS because the banks, when they're looking to give you a mortgage or a loan, mm -hmm. they're looking at your tax return. Okay. And if your tax return does not reflect the income that you say you make, I know people who are millionaires, yeah. but they can't show it on paper. <laughs> right? Right, right, right. Okay. The yeah. banks will yeah. know that you have your money stashed in a yeah. safe or... Uh, a, a box somewhere or underneath your mattress. So they're not going to lend to you based on their lending guidelines. Yeah. So you cannot underreport just so you can save money on taxes. You've got to pay Uncle Sam in order to borrow money. Yeah. In this country, right? You have to report it. So off the books means, or well, we just went off the books. We already know we're on the books. But going back to the previous question on how can they set up a uh, or leverage their leverage. income. Yeah. No. So if you think about going back to the question I said, how many people you think percentage wise can purchase a house? Mm -hmm. I would say mm, anywhere between 15 to 25 percent of the population can actually purchase a home. Mm -hmm. Right. I Meaning they have the income, the down payment, and the credit all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what about the other 75 percent of the population? who cannot purchase a home and who rents, but they still want to leave a legacy for their family because we know that real estate is one of the foundational building blocks to generational wealth, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But credit is another factor. Life yeah. insurance yeah. Right, is another one. Yeah. And um, credit and stocks, right? So the thing is, everybody on this planet, yeah. no matter who you are, at one point or another, whether we like to talk about it or not, is going to die. <laughs> right. right now. Yeah. All right. It's going to happen. Yeah. And unfortunately, during your time on this earth, you will get sick. If you don't believe me, look at the medical system yeah. and look at doctors and the number one cause for bankruptcy in America is medical bills gotcha it's so, true you're right i think you're my right. question to you is you can all while we're young and strong we can hustle mm -hmm. remember what i just said you will get sick at one time in your life and you will die yeah at one time in your life yeah. the question is what do you have in place to secure your family's legacy and income in the event that you're sick and you can't pay your mortgage, yeah. you can't pay your, 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 your workers or whoever, right. right? And what do you are? Do you, the choice is yours if you want to die broke or you want to be a GoFundMe and be a burden on your family. Yeah. Yeah. And you say you love. Yeah. The life insurance game that now that you're in, um, I want, I'm wondering, okay, because it's a mindset also. People have to want to learn about how they can. Uh, create, I guess, opportunities for their beneficiaries, right? And um, so it's you got to have like a, you have to be thinking forward. You got to have a, a long-term game plan, it sounds like to me. But there are other ways to do it through uh, life insurance where people can, um, where they can... Uh, leverage. Where they can not I'm only not leverage, not only leverage, right? But then, because what you're doing is you're educating, right? Well People don't know this. But then you had to go through no. something bad in life. Like you had to go through an experience. You had to go through something for you to realize, okay, look, you know, the, the, the market in real estate is not really good right now. You know, there are a lot of things in place that, I, you know, that stopped me from producing. So I got to look for something else or something ha does happen to me. And then you came upon living benefits, right? But now through educating, like, do you have a team? Do you have people that you work with that, you know? Yes. And I'm actually hiring for anybody looking to get into the insurance business. Mm -hmm. We're literally, we will pay for your schooling to get your license. 
And all you have to do is just follow me on Instagram, which is proven underscore winners. But I do have a team and together everyone achieves more. You cannot do it by yourself. There's 333 million people on this planet. <laughs> much as I want to sell to everybody, Mm -hmm. I can't sell to all 333 million people. So that shows you the magnitude of the opportunity because parents who have kids, they want to protect not only themselves, they want to protect their children. And you were going back to real estate where how some of these, you said some of them leave their, their fathers, leave the money. It's a lot of that with life insurance because people understand that you can get a policy for your kids right? Where it builds cash value. So yeah. by the time they're 18 years old, you would have basically your own college scholarship that you can use to pay for college or to buy or help them start a business if that's what they choose to do, right? So you're giving them a head start, right? Um, and this other thing is that you can use life insurance as a vehicle to get out of debt. Like, I can help the average person get out of debt within nine years, but because your two biggest bills are going to be taxes and interest. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand when they get a mortgage, going back to house rich and cash poor, mm -hmm. people don't understand when you get a mortgage, that first seven years of the mortgage, you're paying at least 70% interest. You're paying maybe 10 to 20% in, in, in principal. And then when the banks see that you're bringing down the interest and you're down about to dig into the principal, they say, hey, would you like to refinance? So now you're thinking, hey, I'm getting a better deal. But really and truly, all you're doing is starting to clock over again where the banks can get 70% gains on the interest. And people don't realize when you get the average home is about 300000 in America, or 334, according to the national standard right now. Mm -hmm. But that 333000 that $300,000 purchase over the life of a 30-year mortgage, you're paying for two houses. That's how the banks are making their money on interest. And they're taking our free income from the labor that you and I work from. We give it to them for free. And they're taking our money and able to lend it out at a hundred times the value, eight yeah. times the value, right? But they're making about a hundred percent on average percent uh, uh, interest gains on our money that we give them for free. But here, I can show you how you can be like the banks and use your money twice. Yeah, they're using their money twice. Yeah, why can't we use our money twice? Perfect and segue. It's the only vehicle where you can be your own bank and you can learn how to leverage it and use your money twice. All right. That's something you have to set up a consultation and we're going to show you how to do that. Perfect segue, right? Just give me like bare, like broad strokes. Like what do guys like me and you, small business owners, people that are like, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, what are some basic qualifications that we need to meet so that we can get a, uh, a good life insurance policy and get this rolling, not just for ourselves, but then also for our teams, right? Great question. So, when you're young and you're strong, especially when you're, as soon as you come out the womb and you get a social security number, please put a policy on, on that kid, right? Because you're working against time, right? And there's this thing called compound interest, right? So that kid has a lot of time for that money to accumulate over the time. They say the average person over their 30 year work span or maybe 40 years, makes about on average $3 million, right? But out of that $3 million, we're only using or saving and most people's retirement plans, most people don't even have a retirement. And then if they do have a 401k, right? Here's a crazy deal if you wanna hear about a deal, right? They say the government gives you the information where you can do tax deferred, right? Now, they say we're not gonna tax you on the money. We'll let you accumulate and grow it. Mm -hmm. So my mom, when she accumulated her 401k, she accumulated to 500000 over the 32 years mm -hmm. that she worked on her job. Mm -hmm. okay, this what happened in 2008 when the market dropped. When the market dropped, her $500,000 retirement nest egg that she was dependent on and her 401k, because it was tied to the markets, she lost 250000 
Mm-hmm. Two years before she's retired. Now that's the other thing. You don't protect it. Because the other thing is when you withdraw your money by the age of 59 and a half, the moment you build it up to say 500,000 or a million dollars, you're like, yes, I got a million dollars from my, my nest egg in my 401k. The moment you take a penny out, the mm. government is taxing you at anywhere between 25 to 35%, yep. depending on your tax bracket. Yep. So you thought you had a million dollars for mm. retirement, but really and truly, you only had about 650,000, maybe 750,000, because Uncle Sam waited for you to take all the risk, to build the capital, to accumulate the capital, and then say, oh, when you build it, I'm taking 25 to 35%. That's mine. Thank you for that. Yeah. How, how, how do you like that deal? Mm. Well, this is the deal that people do, and they don't understand how finances work. And the Rockefellers, since you spoke about that, they put their money in life insurance. Mm. People don't know that they can sue you for your house. They can sue you for your business, mm. right? Well, guess what? For your life insurance, and you can Google this, in, in uh, almost every state, you can't lose to creditors or bankruptcy, Mm -hmm. your life insurance. A lot of states is protected. Yeah. You're protecting your capital. You're protecting your investments. Yeah. You can also borrow against it, right? Now we're talking to the next thing where you can be your own bank. Mm -hmm. So now I'm my own bank. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go and use my credit score because, you know, credit scores for some people, it fluctuates. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. and the average American is over two hundred something thousand dollars in debt. Mm-hmm. So now you can become your own bank. This is how you're using your money twice, guys. Mm-hmm. Where now you can borrow from the policy at a low interest rate, and now usually when you have a hundred thousand dollars and you let's say spend fifty or you borrow or spend fifty thousand dollars, I'm say spend mm-hmm. in the bank. You have a hundred thousand in the bank. You spend fifty. How much money do you have left in the bank? And 50. 50,000, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what you don't realize is that that 50,000 that you have, you're losing the opportunity for the other 50,000 to make money or interest, right? Or gains. Right. But in the life insurance policy, if you have $100,000 mm-hmm. and you borrow $50,000, unlike a traditional bank account where your balance would be 50000 Guess how much your balance is in your life insurance policy? Depending on what the market is doing. <laughs> still $100,000. Yeah, nice. So that means, and it doesn't make sense because like you'd say, wait a minute, David, are you telling me that if I borrow against my policy $50,000 and I have 100000 just using it as an example, mm-hmm. that I still have $100,000 is still gaining Mm. on the hundred thousand dollars and not on the fifty thousand dollar balance Mm. yes this is what i'm telling you this is what we don't know yep yep this is what the wealthy know that we don't know Mm. the banks do this every time with our money so let me ask you a question say somebody like me a small business owner right growing my business and i sign up for a policy and i you know for myself for my children um and how soon would it take for me to be able to borrow against my policy? How soon can I do that? Great question. So there's different types of policies, mm-hmm. but I'm going to talk about the two that most people are familiar with. Mm-hmm. You have what they call an index universal life, which is called an IUL. Mm-hmm. And then you have what we call a whole life mm-hmm. policy, right? Yep. Now, the difference between is that the index universal life, is tied to the stock market. Both perm, right? Both permanent policies. Both permanent policies. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. And before I segue, most people don't know that 99% of term policies never pay out. They never pay out and they wind up going up after they renew. So like you pay out, you pay more after you renew it, like your second time or your third time, it keeps going up. The the, your, your, uh, what you're paying on the policy, the premium, goes up, right? Correct. It's called an increasing rider, Yeah. right? And I'm not going to name any companies, but there's companies who sell you these type of policies. Yeah. And then when you get this policy, because most people are not thinking for the future. They're thinking for the now. Like, just like yeah. when we get car insurance, you're like, give me the cheapest insurance. Yeah, but after six months, right? it goes up. Yeah. Right? 
Now, the thing is, it's the same thing when it comes to life insurance. And in this situation, your credit, your health is your credit yep. in life insurance. Mm -hmm. So the healthier you are, the mm -hmm. cheaper your life insurance will be. Yeah. Then what happens is when we're 20, 30 years old, we get a term policy. Yep. Because it's cheaper. We want to keep our costs down. We probably don't make as much money yep. as we do in our latter years, right? Yep. yep. So guess what happens? You outlive most term policies of 10, 20, and 30 years. Now you outlive your so if you get a 10-year policy term or a 20-year term or a 30-year term at 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Let's say you've got a 30 year term. Now you're 50 years old. Yep. You're not as strong. Your body starts to break down. Yep. You might have kids. You might have a house. Mm -hmm. You have family, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you're 50 years old and that policy lapses and runs out, mm -hmm. you have to now renew. There you but go. Most people are not thinking about their future self. Right. So go in. Years from now, 20 yep. years from now. Yep. And now, when they try to get that policy, Instead of getting, trying to get another term policy, but guess what? At 50 years old, you should get that. Probably breaking down, unless you've been going to the gym and you've been eating such hard <laughs> I don't know, unless you've been really on your health fitness game, Yeah, you're going to pay twice as much or three times as much, mm -hmm. right? Higher so liability, yeah. If you would have got that cash value policy, whole life or IUL, index universal life, when you're young, it lasts you forever. Mm -hmm. That's what I got for my son. So now he has something that will last him forever. Mm -hmm. And the million dollars that I got from him, a million dollar policy, now by the time he's 18, I mean, I don't want to throw my number, but trust me, he's going to be a trust fund baby. Yeah. yeah. This is how you set your kids up so that now when they want to buy real estate at 18 years old, guess what? Now they can borrow from their policy to go buy or use that down payment to go buy a house. They are their own bank, Disney. like you said. They are they they will be their own bank at that age, right? That's correct. Yeah, love that. Love that. Okay. So for the small business owners now, you can you can probably go ahead and purchase uh, either one of the two, the IUL or the whole life, right? As you mentioned, right? And over what length of time though? Would you say a year, two years before I could start borrowing if I have to stop borrowing? Well, cash value policy whole life, you mm -hmm. can start borrowing I have companies where you can start borrowing in year one. Year one. Index Universal Life, most companies, you can't start borrowing after three to five years, mm. usually five years on average, mm. that you cannot borrow against it. Got so it. that's the only caveat or differences, but they mm. still work well. Yep. It just depends on your long-term or your short-term goals. Right. Both and better I, than borrowing from the bank is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And I have policies where you don't need a medical as well. Right. And I can sell in any state. Right. It doesn't matter which state you are. Yeah. Right. So we ha I have it for low, middle, and high-end clients. Mm -hmm. I can help anybody. Right. One more question for you, right? Because there's a little bit of confusion there. Somebody has a bad credit score because of the pandemic hit. You know, there's forbearance. There's like all kinds of things going on and their credit score takes a hit. Uh, would you say it's a good idea for them to start off term and then go to po go to a uh, perm policy? Or do you think they should just jump in? Or is it like case by See, case? That's a great question. And it's not a one size fit all question because mm -hmm. everybody's scenario is different. Mm hmm. So it would be based on their income, it based on their goals, it's based on their debts, it's based on so many other factors that mm -hmm. I can't say this is going to be a one size fits all equation because I can have two people, same age, but different situations, mm -hmm. different health situations, mm -hmm. it's different goals. You know, everybody doesn't run or drive on the highway at the same pace. Right. right? Fast lane, you got the middle lane, you got the slow lane. Right. I don't know which individual, which person that individual is. Yeah. Some people are more risk adverse. Like, I mean, when I say could deal with risk at a higher level, they may have more time. Mm -hmm. Or some people don't have that tolerance to right. take on a lot of risk. Yeah. So it depends on so many factors. Yeah. I can't say that this is how you would do it for, I would, I would have to speak to that individual and then we can determine what would be the right situation for them. Got and it. I represent, I'm a broker, so I represent 17 to 20 different A-rated companies. So okay. I'm always going to be able to give you the best company based on 
your situation. Love that. Okay. So it's, it's very case by case, very unique, right? All right. Where do you see the industry in like, say the next 10 years, right? Cause I know with insurance, it used to be that you'd have to go in and meet with a broker one-on-one, -on -one. but today with everything being, you know, digital, um, how do you see business happening and how do you see, uh, the insurance? Very close. Yeah. Do you think it's going to get oversaturated now? Cause there's like a big, uh, a big market for it. Well, according to studies right now, they said on average is anywhere between 400,000 life insurance agents. And remember, there's a difference between a life insurance agent mm -hmm. and a life insurance broker. Mm -hmm. An agent works for one company mm -hmm. while a broker works for several different companies. So we can really truly look at your best interest and we're in it for the client's best interest because there's agents out there, not naming, that yeah. work for one company. Yeah. And guess what? If that company does not have the best product or service for you, right? Are they really in your best interest? Mm -hmm. or are they for their best interest? Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. And we want to make sure that we help the client for their best interest. Yeah. Now, do I see the? There's always population growing. If you look at a, if you can Google world population clock, mm -hmm. you always see it constantly spinning. There's more people being born than yeah. there are people dying. Right. Yeah. yeah. Three hundred and thirty-three million. They say by the next 10 years, it's probably going to be 380 million people, you know, in the next 10 years. There's going to always be enough because I, I can't live forever. Right. right? So right. there's always going to be an influx. Yeah. Right. It's like the colleges, right? Yeah. You're like, yeah. well, will there always be enough college freshmen? Because you got to have the old with the new. It's a right. constant right. revolving door. Right. So the good news is there's a room for everybody to grow. Nice. Really? nice. And you can build a nationwide agency with that, with the company that I'm with. And you can make, I teach, um, my goal right now is to teach a hundred agents part-time to make 5,000 to $10,000 a month part-time and a hundred eight uh, and 20,000 to 40,000 a month part-time. Wow. Full time. I'm sorry. Full time. Wow. So nice. That's what my goal is to teach a hundred agents to do that. And I will do that because I've done it already. Love it. Love it. This was really valuable, man. Let's play a quick game, right? We're going to play. It's called hands down the lightning round. I'm going to ask you three questions. You tell me your opinion about these three questions. If you don't like the question, right? You go ahead and say pass and we move on to the next one. Okay. Wow. All right. Since, uh, transitioning into, uh, life insurance, what do you think is, uh, where you have more control? Do you think you have more control of, uh, the outcome in real estate or in life insurance? Hands down, life insurance deals fall apart in real estate all the time. Yeah. I can show you 10 houses and you love the house, put in an offer. And even if the offer gets accepted, then you got to go through your inspector. The inspector can tell you everything wrong with the house. And now all those 10 houses I showed you, you got scared away because <laughs> maybe the roof or maybe the foundation, maybe the boiler. Mm -hmm. And then let's say you get past that challenge and then you do sign the contract, right? Then you got the mortgage lender. And the attorney, the attorney is going to advise the client on everything that's wrong. And now the attorney can kill the deal, right? Then the, uh, the appraiser can come in low with the appraisal or the mortgage lender may not be able to give you the mortgage that you thought you were qualified for. Right. Or we might find some liens. The owner might have some parking tickets, unpaid child support. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> right. the lender from a, a, a contractor that did work and he forgot to pay them, you yeah. know? And now the seller says, well, are you going to pay it? The buyer's like, well, no, I'm not going to pay. I didn't cause that. So yeah. now they can walk at the closing table. I've seen that happen as well. Yeah. So these are all factors that I have no control over. Yeah. But when it comes to with insurance, right, the only factor is your health. And even with that, i got situations where even if you're in the worst set of health, I have companies that can help you. Right. And that's beautiful. I have more control over that. Right. With a real estate deal, it would take on average 30 days if you're happy, if you're really good, right, to close. Yeah. With, with real estate, you go 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days before you close. A lot of variables. And yeah. you got to wait to eat. You got to pay bills during that time. Yeah, definitely. So the average commission in 
insurance for one person is a thousand dollars. Yeah. So I can run laps and I meet ten clients a day. Nice. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So definitely hands down the insurance, right? Yep. And you have a bigger pool. Bigger pool. Because okay. You deal with kids to adults to seniors. Yeah. With real estate, you're dealing with just a small demographic of the population that's qualified. Yeah. That can actually purchase. Okay. Uh, second question, best place since you are uh, you're a New Yorker, um, best place to get soul food. Would you say Brooklyn, Ooh. the Bronx, Manhattan, or we could even say Westchester? All right. So I know I'm a Brooklynite, right? So yeah. I'll say there's the five spot in Brooklyn, right, on Myrtle Avenue. Anybody knows the five spot? Right, good soul food. There. I think it's hands down one of the best. Then I know Harlem people are gonna get mad at me because they're gonna <laughs> say it's Ruthie. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Um, um, Roof up there in Harlem, and then they have another one in Harlem that's right across the street from Roof. I just can't remember the name. Yeah. Um, but they're good as well. I just there's can't remember. Center of the lead spot. Oh, there's one in on. Is it 116th Street? Uh -huh. 116th Street, mm -hmm. that good soul food. Oh man, just Google soul food 160th Street. Yeah, okay. Um, somewhere we lost you. There we go. Gotcha. All right, so you, you mentioned a few. You mentioned a few. Um, yeah, I'm getting out of doing, but that one on 116, I have to say. Nice. Out of all the ones I probably ate. That one on one sixteenth is probably the best, but you nice. can't eat there every day, guys. That's like arteries and heart attack <laughs> on steroids, guys. Nice. Sorry. Okay. And the last question: um, Where do you think? Uh, let's let's uh, the last one. The bottom is going to be hands down, right? Okay. UFC, MMA. Let's go MMA, boxing, or football. Where are you spending I'm your Sunday? Definitely a boxer, man. I love awesome. it. I was just watching the Muhammad Ali uh, special that they had on PBS, and yeah. uh, and you know, also my boy, Pretty Boy Floyd. I don't know whether you love him or hate him. Yeah, you know, fifty and all. You know, yeah, <laughs> Mike yeah. Tyson. I mean, yeah. I grew up on Mike Tyson Punch Out. You know, yeah. So boxing is my thing. I love it. Hands down. Okay. All right. Where do where do uh, where do people find you? Um, well, you can call me direct, 718-812-6428, mm -hmm. or you can check me out on my Instagram. It's called Proven, P-R-O-V-E-N underscore winners, W-I-N-N-E-R-S. Mm -hmm. Or you can, uh, you know, literally Google my name, David Jermaine Yufani, or you can go to FFLDreamTeam.com right. and you can find me there as well. Nice, nice. And finally, Dave, what is your bottom line, right? Your reoccurring truth, no matter what happens, right? Things get tough. You go back to this truth and it serves as rocket fuel to propel you upwards. What is that for you? What is your bottom line? One, God, this is God's world, God's planet. And you know what? Everything that we work for and we try to attain, because at the end of the day, we came to this world with nothing. And guess what we're going to leave with? Nothing. <laughs> so, it's God's right. world, right? Amen. So I say serve people, and this, the number one thing is to love others as you will love yourself. And, you know, service to many leads to greatness. And my job, my I feel like my purpose here is to serve and to help others get where they want to go. Nice. Love that. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. David Germain, first uh, family life insurance. Is that right? First family? Is that I'm right? First family. Family first. Keep family keep first. Keep your family first. Family first life insurance. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Check them out on IG, Instagram. This is what you get when you talk to David. David will, it's, it's all from the heart. All of it is from the heart. This is not a sales pitch. It's not a book. None of that. All of it is from the heart. And just by talking to you, man, in an hour, I learned so much. And, you know, our conversations are going to continue to go on, man. This is a true, 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 you know, uh, I want to say a giver, right? A teacher. You're a teacher, you're a giver, and I definitely appreciate this, uh, you know, this conversation. Check them out, ladies and gentlemen. This was the Bottom Line Podcast, where we say what we mean, and we mean what we say, because at the core of everything that is, was, and forever will be, there will always be the bottom line. Mm.